Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I want to welcome you to. My name is Charlie, uh, the lead pastor here, and just really am, am glad that you're here. We're in the middle of a series on Ephesians called Sit, Walk, Stand. It's kind of the breakdown of the book where we first we talk about things that we need to sit and listen to, make sure we understand before we do the things that God's called us to, and then what we need to be careful and stand against. And so we're still kind of in this, this sit piece today, and... Um, this passage that we're looking about almost feels just like a repeat of the thing that he already said. And so he's like, he said it once, and now he's come back to say it again. It just kind of got me thinking about uh, like speeches that you just kind of hear over and over again. And I was thinking about this as a kid. Um, I, I would get my report card, and they would, they would, they would come out every, every nine weeks. And uh, my dad was never concerned about the, the actual grade that I had in the class. I mean, I, I just, just not a humble brag. This just helps with the story. It was... I made mean, straight A's. I mean, every, every nine weeks, always, right? And so my dad, my dad would get this thing, and it was like this, 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 this list of like six things stapled together, one for each class. And 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 the grade is right here, and and then right up here in the top right corner, is the citizenship grade, right? And and um and my dad, my dad would flip through it, not looking right here, just flipping through the top, looking for the uh, the in. So there was three things you could get. There was S, N, and U. S is satisfactory, U is unsatisfactory, and N is what? Yeah, needs help, needs improvement, needs to shut his mouth in class, right? And so my dad would, would, would flip through it, and if he saw one, and he would stop, and he would like, and he had this speech, and I, and I heard it more than once, more than five times. Um, I may not have made as good a grades as you did in school, but I knew how to keep my mouth shut in class. And so you just, you know, you just, you just hear it. You think, why do you keep giving me the same speech? It's like because you keep needing it. And and then and, and then and then you become a parent, right? Which is what I did. You become a parent, and then you find yourself. You just kind of have just a, a handful of speeches that you kind of keep on loop. And so the 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 kid does the thing, right? One of the things, and you and you go, and like, Dad, don't. I don't know what you're gonna have to say. You don't have to say. It's like, well, clearly, clearly, I do have to say it. Um, if I <laughs> if, I, if I didn't have to say it, it means that you wouldn't do it. And, and there was a time I really I really talked about this with my wife that maybe I just need to record like nine speeches, and then when they do the thing, that I just come to is like, will you please listen to speech seven? I really don't have the energy for it, right? So they would just they would just do, they would just they would just do it. But you know, I mean, there's things you know when. when you know, and, and this is kind of a good little Bible study lesson for you. I mean, when things get repeated, when, when Paul says something and then, and then he says it again, it gives you a really good idea that this is, like, this is like one of the primary reasons why he wrote the letter. The way we often study the Bible, you do it as a church, you kind of do it this passage, then this passage, and this passage, and it kind of feel like, well, maybe this, this book is about kind of six different things, or maybe you're doing like a Bible reading plan, and you just kind of look at a few verses and then a devotional. And, and we kind of pick these little pieces out, but we lose sight of the fact that this is like a letter. This is a letter that was written at one time by one guy to one group of people. So there was, there was something or a group of something kind of on his heart and mind. He's like, man, I need to tell this to them. And so I think it's important for us. We'll just kind of get Bible study methods here just for a second. It's important for us to kind of understand this, that there's kind of three, three different things I kind of want you to be aware of that kind of help you get... What maybe when you're reading one of these letters in the New Testament, kind of what the big idea is. The first one is it's almost always in Paul's intro. Paul has an intro. It starts with Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, sent from you to da 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 da. And then he's going to say something like, "My heart for you is." Or in this one, Ephesians one, we're going to look at this passage again. Mark looked at it when we kicked this thing off. My prayer for you is that you would have this, 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 and this. And and um, and you know, you can kind of see in that prayer that. that What's on his heart, and so I'm not saying he's doing this in like a passive aggressive way. It's like, you know, I'm praying for you because my my youth pastor used to do this. He had this little passive aggressive prayers that he would do when we were growing up. He'd be like, "Guys, let's pray, dear God, I just pray that these kids would be quiet and pay attention and stop acting up, so I don't have to tell their parents." Amen. And, and me and my friends, me and my friends would see how many times we could get him to pray that prayer in a one hour meeting. Our record was four. And then my dad would give me the speech. <laughs> but he's not, he's not doing it in a passive-aggressive way. You can just tell this is on his heart. This is what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing, and I'm, and, and I'm hearing from you. I'm getting these reports back of what's going on for you. And I don't want this for you. I want this for you. And so you see in that, in that prayer, 
Uh, another thing we already talked about is repetition. If, he's, if you just kind of keep saying it over and over again, so it's kind of a driver for what he's, this big picture idea he's trying to get across. And another one is, and this is the one that maybe is a little less intuitive, is negative commands. Hey, don't do this. Stop doing this. When you have those kind of negative commands, you kind of get this picture of something bad that was happened that ultimately prompted him to say it. Because you don't give a negative command if they're not doing the bad thing. You don't go to the two-year-old in their room playing quietly and go, Hey! Don't touch the stove. What's what the two-year-old going to do? Like, stove? Right? And they're looking for the stove. You do it with their... It's no... Stop. And so you put those things together, we can get this idea. And so what we've got so far is we're kind of kind of putting these pieces together... We've already, just even in the first, you know, now into chapter 3, in the first couple of now third chapter of Ephesians, we're getting a lot of these repeated themes. He's made it very clear from the beginning, man, you need to have a bigger picture of who God is than what you do. Your image of who God is is way too small. And, and you're thinking about God in these very narrow terms when really God wants to play this outsized role in your life than you're letting him play. Because he's bigger and he wants to be more involved than what you ha- what you have him. And another thing he keeps talking about is, well, at the same time, you you're you're allowing yourself to play too too big a role in your in your own thing. It's not you that's going to do the major work. The major work that needs to be done in your life is going to be done by God, not you. And so you need to maximize him. You need to minimize you. And then he he just keeps repeating, and, and we're going to see this again next week. We we'll see this. We saw it last week. We'll see it this week. We'll see it again next week. This idea of unity. So we need to all be together. We need to be unified. We need to maximize God. And we need to minimize who we are and what we're doing. Okay? So you put all these things together. We're kind of getting this idea, this big picture thing. This is what you're going to need to understand. If you are going to do the things that God has called you to do, you're going to have to embrace unity. You're going to have to make God big, and you're going to have to make yourself small. And we see this again in the very opening of, the, of, of Ephesians in verse, chap, in, in, in verse 18, chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 18 says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. So we see right there, and I'm telling you, you need to let this sink in because you're going to hear almost these exact same words again. It's certainly the same ideas about, about God's riches and his power. I want you to experience not your riches and not your power, but God's riches and God's power. This is what I want from you. I want you, you are settling for something down here when God is offering you something way up here. And so he starts with that and and then has been just kind of unpacking this a little bit for us. We go into Ephesians chapter 2 and he starts talking about, hey, it's not you doing the work, it's God that's doing the work. And then then last week he kind of puts all this together and says, man, and if we're going to do this, we're going to have to do this together. We're going to have to do this as one body of Christ. And now in the first part of chapter 3, which we're just going to, we're going to, we're going to talk mostly about the second second half. In that first half, what he's doing, he's like, hey, listen, you know who I am? I'm Paul. He's kind of re- reiterating to them who, his calling. You know that God called me as an apostle. He kind of brought me out. These other apostles are kind of focusing on Jewish people, and God specifically called me to be a, a missionary to people who weren't Jewish, people like you, and that's why I came. And I never said this was going to be easy, and God never, God never told me. This was going to be easy, this is going to be hard, but it's a calling, and I know that God's with me. And then he says this, so don't, don't get bent out of shape, don't get bent out of shape that I'm in prison. So this is kind of our first picture, it's like, whoa, Paul's in prison while he's writing this. And that's going to matter, because he's going to say something about trusting God for big things. And he's saying this, whatever it is he says about how big and powerful and awesome God is, he's saying it while being in prison. And that's important for us to kind of, to kind of understand. And so, again, I think this is, we can get a picture of maybe, again, another reason why maybe Paul is writing this letter, that they were a little anxious. They were anxious about him being in prison. And so part of their anxiety being in prison is like, hey, I I get that you're upset, 
you need to have a different view of that. You need to have a different view of you, and you need to have a different view of God. So now we continue on in Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14. And again, you're going to hear a lot of the same things here that we've been talking about over the last few weeks. Verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Unity. I pray that out of his glorious riches, there's that word, out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So again, what we t- that's almost the exact same thing. You know, he's talking about his prayer again. I want you to experience God's riches, God's power. It's Jesus in you. It's his spirit in you. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, unity, with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Um, and so here we go. We got him repeating this thing that he says in Ephesians 1. This is my prayer for you. And then he kind of he kind of expands on it a little bit to make sure that we understand exactly what it is he's talking about. But you take that thing in Ephesians 1, this prayer that he had, and this prayer that gets repeated again uh, in Ephesians 3, and we come up with what I think is a really a big idea for Paul, not just in this passage, but really in the entire letter, which is this, is that it's him, not you. It's him, not you. If you want to talk about what does it mean to really live the life that God has called you to, to be the person God has called you to be, to navigate successfully through life, to be someone who honors God, to be someone who lives right, who if you pick your phraseology. If you want to be that person, you're going to have to figure out what it means to make it less about you and more about Him. Now, I'm, now I'm a guy. I've, I mean, if you want to challenge me on this, you can. But I'm, uh, with very few exceptions, I cannot imagine that there's anybody here, even if you're 20, 30 years older than me, that there's people here who have been to church more times than me. I have sat through more services. Uh, most of the time now, lately I'm trying to hear myself, but, you know, everybody, I, I've heard thousands of sermons. I did the math on it once, and it depressed me, so I don't talk about it again. Thousands, thousands of sermons. I can't tell you how many times and how many different ways in all sorts of venues from all sorts of different types of people I've heard this idea. It needs to be more about God and less about you. You just say, it's, it's all about Him. You've got, he's got to become great and you've got to become less. And we, just, and we say these things. And I think there's this part of us that's like, if we just kind of repeat this and we just keep saying it, we'll all just pretend like we know what that means. It sounds real nice, man. Just relax. God, you need to make it about Jesus. Stop making it about you. That's what it is. And you're like, okay, well, I, don't, I don't know if that helps me. But that sounded really good. Maybe we can make a poster out of it or cross-stitch of some kind, a little bumper sticker maybe, I mean something. But what does it really mean? And, I, and the thing that I think that I'm starting to figure out is that the reason why pastors don't really explain what that means is because maybe we don't know. Maybe it's just a little too intangible, and we like to talk about things that really make sense, which is why I think a lot of, a lot of times what we do is we just we skip straight to the walk. Let me tell you what you need to do. You need to read the Bible more. You need to pray more. You need to do bad things less. You know, that, okay, well, I'll write that down. I can do that. But if I say you need to make God bigger in your life and you need to become less, like, I, I don't know what that means, but this is what he's saying. He's saying that out of his glorious riches, he, he may be strengthened. You're not strengthening you. His riches are strengthening you. With power. What power? Through his spirit that's in you. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Now, this is about him in you doing something. And so I need to minimize me and maximize God in me. Like, what, what is, how do I do that? And so the reason, here's the reason why, I, I can tell you why, why this is vague, but um, the first principle I think that we need to make sure that we get from this is I think we need to all agree 
that in, that in my pursuit of becoming the person that I know that God wants me to be and I know that I'm supposed to be, in my pursuit of that, I am often my own worst enemy. And I think there needs to be a moment of that humility that we just need to be able to acknowledge. That, that, that I'm my own worst enemy, I, I'm always making me fail, and, and, I, and, I, and there are significant limits on my ability to, to make myself better. I mean, there are some things that I, that I, that I can do. You know, he's going to talk about some of these things later on. He's like, man, you should stop being ugly to your spouse. So stop, stop, stop talking disrespectfully to your spouse. Well, maybe I can do that. And I say, okay, you need to be, you need to be patient. You need to stop getting angry. Man, I don't know about that. Hey, you should, you should give money to the church. All right, I can, I can do that. I want you to have a generous heart. Uh, there's some actions that I can do, but as far as really affecting and changing my heart, there's limits. And honestly, I just, I just keep running up against these blocks and they're really self-inflicted. And so beyond that, me telling you kind of how you and God need to kind of deepen your relationship and make it more about Him and listen and, more, and lean on Him instead of you, that's going to be a little bit personal to your relationship with Him. I mean, I can say in principle, you need to love your husband or wife more. You need to love your mom or dad more. You need to love your friends more. You can say, okay, I understand that. I need to do that. What does it look like to love your friend, your best friend? Well, it depends on you. It depends on your best friend. And so there are some universal things. There's this humility piece. And I think ultimately for all of us, we need to make sure that we're giving God's voice a, a loud platform. Does His Word, is it able to speak loudly to you? Are you giving Him opportunities, multiple opportunities? Maybe there's something He wants to say to you. Maybe there is something he is wanting to help you with, but you're going to have to give him opportunity. So that means increasing his voice by, by reading the word, by praying, and slowing your heart and mind enough to give him an opportunity to speak back to you. Well, how is he going to speak back to you? Well, you read his word, and you pray, and you quiet yourself, and then you can come back and tell me. You come back and tell me how God speaks to you. My, my, my audible voice stories are limited to two. It really has a lot more to do with intuition. It has a lot more to do with a, something out of a verse kind of jumping out at me. A, a, just an inner prompting that I get in a quiet moment. That's me. What's for you? But we're not ever going to find out if we don't start with the basic principle of it needs to be about him, not me. And I need to acknowledge the fact that often in this pursuit, I'm, I'm my own worst enemy. So it's not, it's, it's not you, it's him. And then he goes on to explain just a little bit more. He's kind of talking about how big God actually is. Because what he's saying is, I think one of our major limiting factors on being and becoming the person that God's called us to is that we have made our God too small. What he is capable of doing and what he's willing to do, we have made very small. And so he touches on both of those things right here um, in, in, um, in verse uh, 18. He says that, that you may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. What is he saying? He's saying here that his love is greater than you know. This is greater than you know. Not only is his love greater than you know, his, his love is greater than you are capable of knowing. It's one thing to say that my knowledge is, you know, if I just learned a little bit more, I think about God loving me this much, and if I learned a little bit more, I can know that God loves me this much. 
What Paul is saying is that your knowledge is the limiting factor. Even if you knew everything that you could possibly know about God's love, it is beyond what you're capable of even knowing. His love is deeper and wider and greater and bigger. And in every possible way that you can measure things, His love is bigger than that. And I'm telling you, if there's one thing that I think that this room and any room you can find yourself in needs to understand, is that His love is greater than you know. I mean, that, that, that is that you need to understand that. You, you are limiting how much God loves you. You think you know that God loves you, but you have a very limited definition and understanding of that. And in that limited definition, there's some of us that kind of grew up this way, and if you didn't grow up this way, maybe you were exposed too much to Christians who did grow up this way, and it kind of turned you off. But we grew up with this idea of a, of a, of, of a really angry God, kind of an angry, judgmental God, who was really just kind of looking for ways to punish you. He had this list of things that you had to do, and a list of things that you should never do. And, and if you did those things, and you followed everything on the list, then this God would choose, at least for a minute, to not be angry. But if you did anything on the list, then he was going to get really angry. He was very judgmental and critical, and he's really he's just trying to make you better. You know, and so and 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 so he loves you, and he loves you, and the way he shows he loves you is by getting mad at you every time you fail. And there comes a point in your life where you're like, this isn't it. This list isn't helping me. And this God, he doesn't really seem to care that much. And so we drop it. And then what do we do? Well, for a lot of us what we do is we pick up a different God. We pick up a different God who's just sweet, nice, and kind all the time. And anytime you make a mistake, it's, oh, buddy, you'll get him next time. It's not that big a deal. Hey, you do you. Whatever it is that you feel like empowers you and makes you happy, you just do that. And then with that comes another list. And this, lo- this, this list is nicer. This list, the list I grew up, was mostly about uh, uh, sexual activity and alcohol consumption. Right? That's what this list is. This list is feeding the homeless, accepting all people. And if you do that, and you just kind of do all these good things socially, and you accept the fact that God just loves you no matter what happens. And that's the key. And then there comes a point where you're like, well, this isn't really doing it either. And then you just give up. But the thing that both of these things have in common is that both of them have a very narrow and small God and a very narrow definition of what God loves, what God's love means. So the parent who only yells in anger at their kid, would you say that that parent is loving that kid well? Yes or no? No. What about the parent who lets their kid do whatever they want? Is that parent loving their kid well? No. But these are our two pictures. God is either like this or God is either like this. And this, this, this isn't helping. This isn't helping. I give up. When in reality, the depth of his love is greater and deeper than we can possibly imagine. And this God loves us incredibly. He loves us so much that he gave his son to die for us. And this God, he would never tolerate your sin. And so he is a little bit like this. He doesn't want you to destroy yourself. That's really good. Don't touch the stove. I ain't mad. Just don't burn your hand off. I love you too much. I'm I'm, going to break his spirit. No, he's going to burn his hand. I mean, he loves you too much to let you destroy yourself. But he also loves you just as you are. And he made you and loves you and wants the best for you. And so both of these people are right and they're both horribly wrong. And, And if you put both of these together and I can say to you, God will not tolerate one bit of sin in your life and he loves you unconditionally. Say, bro, now you're just talking out of both sides of your mouth. You ain't said nothing. Well, what are you even even talking about? 
and I, and I get it. And at the point in which it, it, it begins to not make complete sense and I can't put my mind fully around it, maybe we're getting close to understanding a depth of love that surpasses your knowledge. Because the point in which you can tell me that you can say, dude, I, th- I think I finally figured it out. And at this point, you're going to get my skeptical face. Mm, shut up. <laughs> right? No. Because even once we put our mind fully around that, it is, it's deeper than that. And so God has tried the best that he can to communicate to us what he is like. I, I'm like a dad. I'm like a husband. I'm like, I'm, like a, I'm like a king. I'm like a shepherd. Okay, well, yeah, okay. I'm not putting these things together. I, and I think I understand the, 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 the different points that he's trying to make in those. Okay, I think I understand that. But there are things that, to, to, that he could say about himself and the way that he loves you that he, he, there's not even English words for. And the brain can't even put around. And I'm telling you, what it means is that God loves you more than you understand. Not ever less. And what happens is, is that you know, we, we, we get a little too much judgment maybe. We think maybe that God loves me less or things aren't going the way that I wish that they were. Maybe God loves me less. In reality, what we need to understand is no matter what our circumstances may say, no matter what our brain is trying to understand, that God loves you more than what you realize. Parent is an incomplete metaphor. Spouse is an incomplete metaphor. Shepherd is an incomplete metaphor. And it's always because they can't communicate well enough how much God loves you. And so, I'm going I'm to understand it. God's not going to tolerate sin in my life. God loves me unconditionally. I should not do the bad things. You, you drink alcohol, I don't care. It's just a sin, I don't care. But, but honestly, too much, we know, that's bad. And you're going to destroy yourself if you don't follow God's provision for what our sexual lives should look like. And you should totally be nice to other people and serve the helpless. And you put all of these pictures together, and maybe we just start to get a little glimpse but when we start, we, we, we reject, and every time we reject, God's love and God himself just gets a little bit smaller. And then he reiterates this in, um, in verse 20. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is work within us. Hear that again. He is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. So we're asking God for this, and he's he's able to do way more than that. I can imagine a God that can do this. He says he can do even more than that. And so it's not just that his love is greater than you know, that his power is greater than you can imagine. I I I can imagine a lot. a lot that is, that is how, how does that how does that even work and 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 the immediate response to that for a lot of people is well there was this one time i asked god for this one thing i asked god for this one thing and it didn't happen so if you didn't do the one thing i asked how can you say that he can do more than i'm capable of asking or imagining because i can imagine him doing this one thing i asked him to do And this is where it's important for us to recognize that when Paul said this, he was in prison. He was in prison when he said this. And so, I mean, I don't know Paul personally, but I would imagine if he got to choose between prison and not prison, he would go not prison. And then I would imagine that at some point it was a part of his prayer life. Dear God, not prison. Amen. (laughs) And, And he was in prison. And so what happens for many of us then, I ask God to do this one thing. He doesn't do the thing. He doesn't do the thing, so God then becomes smaller. He is not capable, or he is unwilling, or unloving, and will not do this one simple thing that I ask for him to. So God becomes smaller. When it would seem that for Paul, not prison, please, no prison, God becomes bigger. 
God is trying to do something in my life and through my life and wanting to do something inside me. God has wanted me to do something with these people. He's wanting me to have this experience for some reason. And so His love is greater than I imagine. And I see Him doing things greater than what I asked for. I asked to get out of prison. What He did was bring jailers to faith in Jesus Christ. That's what He did. So I asked for this little thing. What he did was up here. And I'm, a, I'm focused and obsessed about the one thing he didn't do, losing sight of the fact the thing that he did. And what is he doing with Paul in prison? He is deepening his faith. He's deepening his trust. He's reforming and changing his heart. And we're asking to avoid a bad thing when the thing that God is wanting to do is reshape your heart and life. Well, I can't eat. I can't imagine that. Okay, let's pray, right? It would never cross my mind. There's this, one, there's this one heart problem that I've had. There's this one lifelong struggle that I've had. There's this pain and hopelessness that I've faced and, and battled with my whole life. And I, quote, can't imagine it ever being any different. Those are the things that God does. God does miraculous transformations in the hearts of people who make Him big and them small. But if I'm big and He's small, then I can't even imagine that He would do it. And why would I even bother to ask? Because I'm still stuck on this overly simplistic small God who won't do this one thing, who is obsessed with one of these two lists, and He either has neither the passion nor the power to do anything real in my life. In fact, God is wanting to do something incredibly real and incredibly powerful in your life if you will let Him. But that begins with me being small and Him being great. So now's a great time. Now's a great time as we transition to worship and reflection. It's time to pray. And, and, and more than maybe on any other Sunday, I would encourage you, man, to go back there and, and talk to some of these awesome people on our prayer team because um, there, there's some limiting factors that you have in your head that are keeping you from really praying and believing that God will do the big thing. And we all have our limiting factors, but the great news is these awesome people who would love to pray for you and pray with you, um, they don't have the same limiting factors as you. And they would gra- gladly pray boldly for you if you're in a place where you can't. But let's also all, man, let's just spend some time just praying that God will come big, that we can begin to grasp another level of the depth and power of, of God's love and His ability to really transform our lives and stop settling for things. So let's do that as we worship, as we pray. There's prayer candles and and the cross and communion. There's lots of ways to respond. We have an opportunity to give back to a God, a God who is generous with us. We get a chance to be generous back with Him. There's lots of great ways to respond. But let's pray. Let's pray for ourselves and pray for each other that God and His love and His power will be big. Let's pray. God, I thank you. God, I thank you that um, you are not that God I grew up learning about. That you love me way more than that, and you are way bigger than that. And God, I'm so thankful to you that you are not the God that, that, that people in college told me I was supposed to replace. The God that you do passionately care about my life and my sin. And you do hate those things in me that are hurting you and hurting me and hurting others. And God, I pray that I, I'm just thankful, God, that I've just begun to scratch the surface of the depth of your power and your love. And God, we're thankful for your son, the life that he lived and the death that he died for us. That death and resurrection, God, that makes all this possible for us to even have a relationship with you. 
And so, God, I pray that, that each one of us would fully and totally put our faith in you through your son, Jesus, and then begin and continue a journey of exploring the depths of your love and your power. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.